Hello everyone, here Elohim again. This time I bring someone very awesome that probably you know, that is Jason Monkey. Jason Monkey is an author which Gardnerian initiate, high priest, very well known in this community, is the like the expert in Wiccan history and culture. Uh, hello Jason Monkey, how are you doing? <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. Expert's a strong word. Uh, it is It is something I'm interested in though. But you are, you are like the reference in this community. I I arrived in the United States in 2015. And when I arrived, I remember that your books were everywhere. You was doing all kinds of events everywhere around the country and in other places. And you was directing at that moment Patios Pagan, the blog, where you continue writing. You was like everywhere and everybody yeah. knows you. Uh, so what was the reference? Uh, and many people say, it's including editors, if you want to put some reference in your books or something, look for Jason books because in there you will find very accurate information. That, that's pretty nice. There are certainly a lot of footnotes in the books, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay. I will start with the questions now. Uh, first of all, in which city do you live and what is your favorite thing about your city? I live in Sunnyvale, California, which is right in the heart of Silicon Valley. It's about 40 miles south of San Francisco, 10 miles north of San Jose. It's, I mean, for this area, it's a small town, but it's 140,000 people. And for a lot of people, that's not very small, but it feels like a small town. I live five blocks from the downtown of where we live. The train station is nearby. I love how walkable it is. There's a park across the street. I don't know, it's just very comfortable. Uh, it, it's very expensive because it's Silicon Valley, but it's very comfortable. And I think that's what I like about it the most. And, and it's multicultural. I love like when I go on a walk, I hear 10 different languages. You know, that that's awesome. I'm from the Midwest and I also lived in the South for a while and you just don't get that there. Yes, sounds like you are very well connected with all the places around. That's pretty good. You are not disconnected from the city. One of my friends is actually a former mayor of the city, which is nice. So, you know, I've got an in if I have a problem. You have influence. You have friends in power. Yeah. Good, Good to know also. Jason, uh, you have made a lot of books, very good books, but this also is a representation of your craft. You have been in the craft for a long time. Do you can let us know how did you find the craft when, how this happened, how was this process for you? Because for everyone, it's a totally different experience and every experience is very unique, it's very important. So if you want to share something about it. You know, I, it's either a long story or a short story, I'm never sure. When I was young, I was really interested in like unexplained things, Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot. Next to all those books are all this, all the books about witchcraft and vampires and the devil and stuff like that at the library so i was reading that stuff pretty early between seventh and eighth grade i read my first witch book which was a sybil leak book and i did one of the spells in the back of that book and it worked and it scared the shit out of me and i didn't do witchcraft for a long time after that and then when i was 21 i was a huge fan of led zeppelin and i discovered this book called celtic magic by dj conway it's not a very good book at all. The history is pretty bad and stuff, but DJ Conway was a very good writer and it had Wicca in it. And at 21, I was ready and I just gravitated towards it. And I think within 48 hours of reading that book, I was amending my Christian prayers to include goddesses, you know? So uh, that book had a huge impact on what I do and brought me into this community. And weirdly before that, I was a Methodist. I was president of my church youth group. I was like very Christian, you know, and that's all gone now. This is certainly not a phase. I remember you, you have like months ago, not, not a year, like six or months or nine months ago, uh, this talk with um, Tom Money in some podcast. I don't remember which one. If I find it, I will add the link below. Uh, you were talking about DJ Conway, uh, this book, something about dancing with dragon, something like that. I remember that conversation that you had months ago. Uh, it's the one reference that I have about this author because I, I don't have the opportunity to read it yet. 
Uh, my next question here for you is being a Garnerian initiate, because you are initiate in, in Garnerian witchcraft, how do you think that this change or, or shift your perception about the craft? Because when you are not initiate, that's pretty good to continue being a witch, but when you are inside of a mystery tradition, the shift is a lot. How do you think that this was for you? You know, I love being a gardenarian. I, what I find fascinating about it is I think that there's a certain energy to traditions. And when you practice the tradition and you do the ritual in the same way that somebody did the ritual 50, 60, 70 years ago, you tap into this energy. Like I'm tapping into the energy that Gerald Gardner and Doreen Valiente and Margot Adler was a gardenarian for a while. And anyone who's ever been a gardenarian, I feel like I'm touching that energy. And I think that's what attracts me to it the most. Also, as someone who usually writes all the rituals for their coven, being in a tradition means I don't have to write the rituals as much because somebody wrote them a long time ago, which is kind of nice. Uh, but again, it's, but when you do that ritual that's old, you really are feeling that connection to the witches who came before you, you know, because they did it that way. And I think that's my favorite part of it is being able to tap into that energy. And a lot of traditions too have particular deities that they honor. And you're not allowed to say the names of those deities to people who are non-initiates. So it feels like you have like this private set of gods just for, your, for yourself and for your tradition. And I think they have extra power because of that. And I really like that. So I'm close to the deities that are a part of Gardnerian craft. Got it. Uh, I, I'm watching um, behind you this incense, what it is, because it looks very nice. I, I imagine that it smells very nice too. It's copal is what I'm burning on a charcoal, on charcoal. And then I have some Hathor incense burning like in a different place in the room. So everything smells really good. My cats peed on the couch last night. So I need to burn a lot of incense right now. Okay, yeah, I know that. Uh, my next part here, my next uh, question for you is, you have wrote many books. How, obviously your first book is like your first children. When you are doing the first one, the first grab is all an experiment, you are, you are not sure what are you doing well, what are you doing wrong, which mistakes you, you are committing. And when you have more experience, each book is like more, is like easier to do. How do you think that you have changed from your first book years ago to the last one? Because you have a new book coming literally now. So my first book was called The Witch's Athame, and it was a part of a series. So they had already done the Witch's Broom when I started writing the book. And since it was my first Llewellyn book, I was really influenced by the Llewellyn books that I had read in the 90s and the early 2000s. And I think I didn't really have my own voice for a lot of that book because I was trying to adopt maybe the Llewellyn House style a little bit, you know, because I didn't want them going, oh, this is bad or this rocks the boat or this is really different. So I think now I write with my own voice a little bit stronger. And there are also things in the Athame book that I don't really like um, in retrospect. Like I talk about like the gender of the knife because people have long associated it with like male energy and stuff. But I kind of think a lot of that's sort of silly. It's a knife. If you, if you think it's got male energy, then it does. And if you don't, then it probably doesn't, right? It's, it's not anything but a knife that you use for magical purposes. So I like my books better now because I feel like my voice is stronger in the book. Also, the more you write, the better a writer you become. So I think my books are better written now. Though, I will say, I think the Athame book has really good rituals because that's what I had written the most of before writing that book. And I'd always been really proud of my rituals. So I think those hold up. So but there are parts of it I would like to rewrite if I ever get a chance. Yeah, maybe soon. So you, you are, you could say that now you are like more conscious, like author of the things that you are writing, right? Um, I'm just, I think I'm a lot more confident in my writing. And I think that shows in the book. My first book that was not a tool book was my fourth book. So it took me a long time to kind of get the courage to really write about what I desperately wanted to write about. 
And that book was transformative witchcraft. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm writing about initiations and elevations and I'm writing about the great right and I'm writing about the cone of power. And I feel like I really found myself during that process. Got it, got it, got it. So uh, let me come to the, to the now. You, in, in less than a year, you have published three books and you have another one coming very soon. Uh, one of those books was The Horned God. Why do you think it was important to write this book? Tal one, tal one. Why do you think it was important to write this book? For me, this was an act of devotion. It really was. I've been a follower of the Horned God really since like my second or third year of practicing witchcraft. I've always been close to the god Pan, Kronos, Dionysus, all figures that I think of as Horned Gods. And there really hadn't been a book about the Horned God published before. There's a couple of anthologies. I think there's Horns of Power is one. There's been some standalone books, but they're really short. And I really wanted to write the story of the Horned God. You know, how did this figure come about? What does this figure mean? How do you get to know this figure? How do you commune with this figure? And I felt like I was probably qualified to write this book. I've been doing Horn God workshops for a long time, uh, 20 years or so. So I've always been re researching the Horn God, finding more information about the Horn God. And also I'm free to change my mind about things. And I think sometimes that's hard for people. You get exposed to an idea very early on and that's the only idea that you'll accept from then on. But one of the things about the Horn God, to me, it's always been this sort of evolving story. So I can add things to the Horned God. I can say, well, maybe that doesn't belong like we think it does. And uh, so, yeah, this was a devotional act. I wanted to write a book for him. I wanted to write a book for Kernonos and for Pan. And I wanted to help people experience the joy that the Horned God brings me. And I hope that this book is a conduit for people to experience that power and that energy. Yes, uh, I am waiting uh, for personal reasons. This is a story. I'm waiting with a group of people from out of the country that this book comes out in Spanish in any moment, please leveling, because maybe they don't know, uh, but in Latin America, we have a very um, influence about the Horner God. Actually, if you look uh, on the internet in Mexico, it, we have certain groups, uh, pagan groups. One of those groups is from 20 years ago, led by Ulises Santillana. Ulises is like a great poet in Mexico. Um, they, they have this blog from many years ago, Hysteria Pagana, that is actually like uh, pagans hysterical. They have, they have been around for a long time and they have groups of men who for one reason or another, straight men or gay men, for one reason or another, they don't identify totally with the conception of the mother goddess, and they write a lot of material about the Horned God. And they always say it publicly in their posts and the stuff, oh, why we don't have a book like this one in Spanish? Uh, we really don't have it. And when this book comes out, uh, in many of my comments on Instagram and Twitter, many of my friends were asking, you know if a book will be in Spanish in any moment? I really don't know if I, I, it's not even my publisher, so I really don't know. But many people is waiting that book in Spanish. Actually in Spain exists a group of people, I think that is uh, the Horner, the Horner Mail Horn or something like that. It's a very strange name. It's a group of like 50 or 60 members. All of them are men who venerate the Horner God. In Mexico exists the the seed group. The seed group is the group of, um, group of Semilla. This means that it's a bunch of men who venerate the Horned God and they have these weekly meetings via Zoom now. And they do rituals about the Horned God. Most of them are straight men between 30s and 50s. And they are looking for this kind of books in Spanish, just for recommendation for the future. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, I think as an author that, you know, like a lot of this is all out of our hands, right? Because I get yeah. people ask me, asking me often, you know, when is, when is this book going to be an audio book? Or is this going to be in Spanish or French or various languages? And that's all kind of contracted out by the publisher. Like we don't have any control over it. And, you know, hopefully 
there are more books that are outside of English. We live in this great golden age of witchcraft and pagan publishing right now. And I want everyone to be able to take advantage of it. I know, weirdly, I've had a bunch of books come out in Russian of all places. I never understood that. I think the Horn God is going to be in Polish soon. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's so random. And a couple, I've had a couple of books in French too, but it's just always so random. I don't know when or why or how these decisions get made. Okay. Uh, after the Horn and Gold, so as you made all, all of this big launching with other authors next to you, you had the book of, the Legonese Little Book of Jewel in December. If for the people who follow you, we know that you are a little obsessed with December, with the season. <laughs> First of all, why take you so much time to do this book? Second, why this season, why this book? So Llewellyn's Little Book of Yule is a part of the Llewellyn's Little Book series, and they are very little books. They're not, I think, maybe 50,000 words, but I've always loved Yule uh, and Christmas. You know, I, as growing up in a Christian household, you know, obviously we celebrated Christmas, though it was never particularly religious, but I always loved that energy of that time of year. It was the one time of year where you were encouraged to believe in magical things. I mean, what is Santa Claus, if not a magical thing, or whoever your gift giver is? So I always was really attracted to the season. And then as a witch, you know, I found all of these traditions that people do today are 2000 years old or longer, right? I mean, there's something really uh, powerful about winter solstice and how it resonates with people over the centuries. And any, even when people wanted to get rid of Christmas celebrations, they just couldn't do it. So I wanted to write a book that had all that history um, both 2000 year old history and the history from the last 150 years and show how magical the season could be. And so that was Llewellyn's Little Book of Yule. It was actually kind of hard to write though because it was little. So, you know, you want to cram it full of history things and you, you have to like make sure that what you're cramming in there is like really concise. So you can put as much of it in there as you want. And the little books too have a lot of activities not just spells, but some crafty things. And so if I'm gonna do the crafty things, I have to try them out first because I don't wanna give somebody crappy things to do. So I had to try them out. So that took a little bit of time too, but I'm really happy with that book because I mean, it's just sort of my love letter to my favorite season. I know for a lot of witches, it's always Samhain, but I think that there's more ancient stuff during the winter solstice season than there is at Samhain. Got it. Uh, thank you for all of this insight. Now, this uh, 2022, you have this new book that is a whole collaboration. That one, The Witch Book of Spellcraft. Um, this book is a very big book. It's a very heavy book. And it's also in collaboration with some of your colleagues and um, with your partner. Uh, how was this experiment? Because I know that two or three years ago, you made a book with Laura Tempest Sacro, a very great book that is always sold out in New York. <laughs> and now you have this new book in, collab in collaboration with a bigger group, with a big, <clears throat> sorry, with a bigger team. How was this process? How was the idea? How did you find the different voices for the book? How was this? Because for authors, it's something very complicated to do. It was very different than working on the witch's altar with Tempest. With that, we just sort of divided things up and I would write a chapter and she would write a chapter and we didn't really collaborate. We just split up the work. This book, I wrote most of the words, but the ideas are all four of us. And we wrote it during COVID. So there were challenges there. The original plan was we were gonna meet, we would talk about a magical practice and then we would go into our ritual room and I would watch Matt, Amanda, and Ari, who are my uh, co-authors, I would watch them do spells. They're much better at spells than I am. They're really great at spellcraft. And I was just gonna take notes and see what they came up with. And we got to do that a couple of times, but because of COVID, we really couldn't do it because we couldn't have people in the house. There were times we couldn't even meet outside because at the same time, California was burning down all the forest fires. We were told to stay inside because the smoke. Uh, so it was really a challenge. But 
uh, what we do is I would ask them questions and I would take notes and get all of their opinions about whether it's candles or herbs or stones. And then I would make a chapter out of the notes and I would go through and I would like cross everything off that each of them had said. So I was getting all of their ideas into each chapter of the book. A couple of times they helped me, you know, they would write like a bit of a spell and then I would Llewellynize the spell. I think it's hard when you're not someone who's been writing for a long time and you're, you know, you do spells and you don't have to write all the steps out in your brain, right? You just do them. So my collaborators had some really great spell ideas, but they weren't as fleshed out as they needed to be in a book. So I would help them flesh them out. Uh, everybody that worked on the book has sort of special skills, like Ari, she's very, very great with stones and crystals. Matt's really good with her herbs and Amanda's really good with oil. So I would just talk to them about specific things like, Amanda, tell me about the oils that you use and then write all the notes. And Matt, tell me about herbs. And with Ari, you know, I was like, we need to do stones and crystals today. I'm going to take you to the bar. You're going to have a gin and tonic. And we're going to talk about stones and crystals. And I'm going to take a lot of notes, you know, and that's kind of how the book came together. Uh, then I would give them the different bits of the book. And every once in a while, I might have to make a little change for them or something if they didn't like it. But with four opinions, sometimes the information in the book contradicts itself because everybody does magic a little bit differently. So like um, one of the examples is pyrite. So I ask Amanda and Matt about pyrite and they're like, well, we use pyrite for wealth and for prosperity spells. And I'm like, pyrite's fool's gold. That's confusing. I would use it in a confusion spell. And they were like, well, that makes sense. And then I was also like, well, what you say makes sense. So we included both versions, right? Because if you think that it's good for wealth spells, then it is. And if you don't, and you want to use it to confuse your enemies, then that works too. That sounds super great. Uh, I'm fascinated because I have been reading the book from the moment I received it home. Um, the elaboration of the spells, the introduction of every of every one of you, the way how everything is so um, clear in the information, uh, the, the whole insight is great in there. I really appreciate this book. I really like the book. I really recommend you the book. If you are watching this video, uh, in the links below, you will find it. Uh, the link for the book. Now, uh, we don't go to spoil too much, but you have another project coming in December with Astria Taylor. Everybody loves Astria. And you have this new book about Greek mythology or Greek gods. Uh, if you can say something about it. Oh, yeah. So we finished it. So it's like I'm ready to talk about it. It's in my brain. So Estrella and I have been friends since 20, gosh. Gosh, what is it, 2017? I met her in 2017 and we've been friends for many years now, I guess. And we talked about doing a project together. And she's like, well, what do you love? And I'm like, I love the Greek gods. And I was like, what do you love? And she's like, I love the Greek gods. Let's write about the Greek gods together. And it was much more like the collaboration with Tempest. We sort of divided everything up. So each section about the major gods has a history of that particular deity. Then it has personal insights with a lot of contributors that are not us. We asked people who had, you know, connections to goddesses like Hera and Artemis and Hecate to write bits for us. And then there's a third part in each of the main deity sections about working with that deity. So Estrella is really good at doing the magic and doing the spells. And a lot of her stuff is spell work. I like rituals. So a lot of the stuff that I contribute are rituals. And it was just a really fun book. It was a hard book because we really wanted the information to be accurate. There are 500 footnotes in the book because there's a lot of history in the book. And we wanted to take the history really forward too. So the history just doesn't stop once Greece was absorbed by the Roman Empire. You know, it traces the evolution of the Greek gods into the Roman Empire. Because for a long time, people were more likely to say Venus than Aphrodite or Jupiter instead of Zeus. And that's a part of the story of the Greek gods. And then how they were continued to be, how they continued to be honored during the Middle Ages and how they were reawoken during the Italian Renaissance and then spread out throughout the world all over again. And how days of the week in a lot of languages are named after Greek and Roman gods. 
You also have gods who have evolved in the last 200 years, like Pan and Hecate, I think, really, because we've seen her kind of rise to prominence over the last 10 or 15 years, especially. Uh, so we wanted to conclude all that in the book. I'm really excited about people reading it when it comes out in December. It's the, I think the history passages are fun and well thought out. They're not like super in depth. It's not like you have to read 10,000 words on the history of Dionysus. You know, it's not that kind of book. But with in those 2,000 words, though, you're going to get a pretty good grounding of how people worship Dionysus in in Greece and then later in Rome and then, you know, after that, too. So that was really fun. Estrella is a, a terrific writer. I couldn't have asked for somebody better mm -hmm. to write with. And there are a couple of places where we did actively collaborate. Like she would write a chapter and then I would go in and add things and vice versa. Not a lot of the book, but a little bit of the book and the introduction and things. Got it. Uh, these collaborations with Astria, with Laura, uh, and with all this team for your new book, uh, this shows how integrated you are in the community. Uh, and you are part of the, this community, I mean, you are in a blog, you always bring other people to write in the blog. You also have been participating in many events. Uh, what is your favorite thing about the witch pagan community? Which is the aspect of this community that you think could be a little better? I think a lot about how it could be better. So I, I for one, one of the things I think people forget about our community is that it's very small in a lot of ways. You're never more than three or four people away from knowing someone else, right? I mean, you always have a mutual friend who knows somebody that you would like to know. And I'm always surprised when I hear gossip that is just not true at all in the community uh, directed at people. And I'm like, why don't you talk to them, right? Why don't, why don't you talk to each other? Instead of just talking about this person, why don't you talk to that person? And that's what I'd really like to see more of is communication amongst people. Uh, we all share so much in common. I think most of us are trying to do the right thing. Uh, sometimes people don't do the right thing. It should be called out for it for sure. But you know, every once in a while you just hear weird things like a couple, I think it was a year ago, someone said, if, if you write a Llewellyn book, Llewellyn makes you edit someone else's book. And I'm like, you know a Llewellyn author, it shouldn't be that hard. Like that doesn't happen, right? I mean, why are you saying weird things? You know, if you think that's happening, you should talk to somebody. For the most part though, I think we have a really encouraging community. I think we lift each other up. I, I think that we're on the right side of history when it comes to a lot of social justice issues. I think we're a very tolerant group and an accepting group. And I think that speaks very well of us. My interactions in most pagan festivals are always positive. I never feel like I'm in competition with my fellow writers. It always feels like we're peers and we want each other to do well. My friend John Beckett says, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. And I think that's really true. When I see one of my friends do well, I'm smiling because I'm happy for them, but it's also going to do good for the other people that they're close to too. Um, you know, every community has challenges. I think that we're better than most though. At least I hope we are. I think the same. I think that um, the aspect of the aspect of social justice and integrity and how we let other people come is exactly what, what you are saying. Is that is we are like a little more open to everyone. I arrived here seven years ago. Um, I don't talk the language. Uh, I remember how many people were very open. Oh, when you talk the language, you can come and offer classes and do things and visit the stores and. Everybody were, were uh, very warm and totally, I'm pretty sure that I know will be where I am now if nowhere for that support in that moment. Because when you are arriving in a place that you don't know anyone, you don't know the language, you don't know even the street, you don't know where you go to live, it's very complicated, it's traumatizing. And the people in this community were super, very well welcoming with me. Uh, so, so I am the proof that what you are saying is true. It's not untrue. Uh, my next question for you uh, is 2020, 2021, how was these years for you? Uh, terrible. They were really bad. I like people. Uh, not being able to go out and do festivals 
not being able to see people, not being able to do ritual with Coven, that was hard for me. Um, it was much harder than I thought it was too. I, writing books during the pandemic was really like pulling teeth. At first, it was something to focus on and kind of shut things out. But the more I you know, had to write, the more I didn't see people, the harder it got. Because I think that seeing other people is fuel, right? It gives me fuel to write. It inspires me to go out and do things. And having that all taken away was difficult. I have friends who did really well during the pandemic. They don't like people. And you know, being able to hide was high on their list, right? They were really cool with that. I was bad at it. I, I didn't like it at all. Uh, so there were a lot of days spent on my porch drinking wine and whiskey, you know, um, being depressed and moping around the house. I had three books come out during the pandemic. And you know, before that, you always you know have a book launch party and people come and you get to sign their books and everybody's excited for you. And now you have your book launch party on computer and you just stare at a screen. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's just not the same. It, it was bad. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really itching to get out and do things. Next week, I'm going to Minneapolis. for I think it's the first big pagan festival in the United States, Paganicon, to come back after the pandemic or depending on how you look at it during the pandemic. Um, yeah, but that's exciting. Uh, I need that. I, I need people. So it was rough. It was it was rough. Thank you for that. Um, it's always uh, nice to listen uh, how people was in, in this because everybody in their different position, in their different home, uh, everyone thinks that I'm doing wrong or I'm feeling wrong because I miss people or nobody is connecting with this feeling that I have and everybody actually is thinking the same. So we are connecting in this uncertain time because everybody is missing something. Even if you don't like uh, have people around, uh, if you are a little more introspective in that aspect, you continue missing something, going out, uh, walk alone in the street, everybody's missing something and we are connected in that feeling. I have suffered from depression for a long time and it's not something I talk about a whole lot, but you know, it was, it was depressing those two years. And I think it takes a toll on your, on your mental health, but also on your physical health. It's like, well, I don't, why bother, you know? And that's how I felt a lot during it, you know, you know and other people had much greater challenges than I did. I mean, I, I worked from home, I got to stay in, I wasn't in any danger, but my wife went into work every day. She works in the medical field. Um, yeah. So yeah, it just, it was a challenge. It was a very challenging time. Yeah, for, for everyone, thank you for sharing that uh, because it's important to know the positions and perspective of other people. I really appreciate that you share that. Uh, I have two signature questions that I always do to everyone. The first one is, do you remember which was your first book on witchcraft and magic? So there was the book that I read between seventh and eighth grade which I think was Sybil Leake's Complete Art of Witchcraft. And it's either that or Cast Your Own Spell. I don't remember the exact title, but I do know that it was Sybil Leake. And I've owned, I own both of those books now. And I, I kind of debate with myself which book it actually was. But that was my first, I can't say that I read the whole book because I really didn't, but I do remember reading parts of it. And I remember doing the spell in the back of the book uh, to find a lost item. It, it was a book I checked out from the library and I checked out a bunch of other books and my dad's like, all right, we're going to the library. We need to take the books back. And I couldn't find one of them. And you know, you know, when your parent is getting agitated, my father was getting very agitated. So I opened the Sybil Leak book and there was a spell to find a lost item. And I cast that spell and I found the lost book like 10 seconds later. Uh, so it had a, it had a pretty big impact on me. I remember reading in the book, the words O oh, triple goddess. So from then on, when people would ask me, you know, like about witchcraft, not that I was practicing, but if it came up somewhere, I'd be like, they don't worship the devil. They worship some weird triple goddess is what I would, you know, say. So I, I took things from that book. And then as an adult, it was Celtic magic by DJ Conway. And then shortly after that, I read, you know, Silver Raven Wolves to Ride a Silver Broomstick, all of the big 90s books. Yeah. Silver Broomstick had a huge impact on me. I love that book. Out of all the 90s, 80s, 101 books, that's my favorite one. Yeah. Uh, so 
could be that spell to find a lost item? Because my next question is, which was your first spell? Could be that one? There was a spell before that. So I think I was five years old and I did, this was something I did with my father. But as a kid, I had warts, little warts on my fingers and couldn't get rid of them. Like every day we would put like this stuff called compound W on them that would eat through the wart. And we did that for like a year. And then one day the wart was gone. It had been eaten through. And then I went to bed and I was all happy that it was gone. The next day it was back came like sprouted right back up. So my father says a couple of weeks later, he goes, Jason, I've been talking to somebody at work. They gave me this thing called the moon trick and it's a magic spell and we'll get rid of the warts. We have to wait till the full moon and then we're gonna cast a spell on the warts. And we did that and they actually went away and they've never wow. come back. I mean, it's just the weirdest thing, but they, but they, it completely worked. Um, I forgot about it for many years. I didn't even think about it as like my first spell, but it really was, you know, there's my dad reading from this piece of paper, probably mimeographed, which is like this wet way of making copies. It was before copy machines. I'm that old. And, you know, and he was reading the thing and we were putting my hand in the moonlight. And that was really my first spell. So your father pulled you in this direction. I think I was destined to end up here. I mean, you look back and there are those kind of moments like that when you're doing magic at age five. But I also remember in second grade, we had a day off from school. It was President's Day or Lincoln's birthday because we lived in Illinois. That was what they celebrated there. And we went out, I went outside that morning. I looked up at the sky and the sun was high and was beautiful. And there was like blue sky everywhere though it was really cold. And I thought to myself, why don't people worship the Greek gods anymore because I loved Greek mythology from a young age and I was like I'm gonna say a prayer to Zeus and that was the first time I'd ever said a prayer to a pagan god I was just like hi Zeus I hope that you let me have a good day you know so I just feel like I was supposed to end up here you know you look back at your life and there are these little signs got it thank you for sharing one of these insight about, about your life and how all of these things were putting you in this direction because now we are enjoying all everything that you are teaching us in your classes, workshops and books. We really appreciate that. Uh, I don't have really more questions for you. Uh, do you have something else that you want to share? Anything else that you want to say? Wow, you know, we pretty much talked about all the books. I just will say though, you know, I feel like this community has given me so much over the years. I met my wife at a pagan student group of all places. Oh. Yeah, and I we've been you. together. I, I didn't know. Yeah, um, you know, and my best friends are from this community and I've had so many great experiences. I'm just always feel so blessed to be here and be able to write books and to share things and people want to listen to me talk and prattle on for long periods of time. It's really nice. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Uh, for everyone watching this video, if you see below in the description, please don't avoid the description. I know it's long, but go to the description. You will find all the links. Please uh, find Jason, his Instagram account, Twitter account, website, Etsy shop, uh, his books, everything is here in the description. You can check what other books he has. Uh, next project, his website, Instagram, Instagram, follow him, stalk him asking things, you know, you know the protocol. Um, if you read any of his books and you have in your shelter, please take five minutes to make a review for the, of the books to recommend to someone else, because many times we buy many books and we forget to give a review. If you really enjoy the work of Jason and you want more books from him, please give him reviews. This is very important for the publisher. It all helps. Yeah. Thank you, Jason, for your time. I know that we are in very complicated time. You are uh, preparing yourself for this uh, next event. You are launching this book. You have another one coming. So I know that you were busy. So thank you for this. Thank you for having me. Um, are you going to be in New Orleans in, uh, in August? I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Hopefully, we get to run into each other this, this yeah. summer or something. That would be terrific. Yes, or could you come to New York? Absolutely. And if you're ever in the Bay, you're always welcome and you have a place to stay. Got it. Thank you. And thank you everyone for watching this video. Uh, 
by everyone, stay well, stay safe, and stay well, be kind with everyone.